الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد continuing with the story of Adi ibn Hatim we start that the portion of the story where his sister Sifana was cut loose by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam due to the tremendous amount of respect that he had for her father. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when she said, Ana bintu Hatim al Ta'i, Kareem al Arab, Fa'fu anni, Fa'fu Allah, Afu Allah Ank. She said, I'm the daughter of Hatim al Ta'i, Kareem al Arab. The most generous man from amongst the Arabs. She said, "Fa'fu anni, a'fu Allahu ank. Pardon me, excuse me, and release me from this situation. And may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala treat you the same." So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam iltafata ila ashabihi wa qala, "Khaluha, fa inna abaha kana yuhibu makanim al akhlaq." The Prophet ﷺ said, Let her go, free her. For indeed, her father used to love good character. Her father exemplified good character. Makanim al akhlaq, the core of our religion. The Prophet ﷺ said, Innama utitu li utimma makanim al akhlaq. My only mission was to come and perfect moral character. That is the core of the Prophet Sallallahu mission was to perfect moral character. So of course he had an affinity to anyone who exuded and exemplified the same type of mission regardless of what their religious description was. The Prophet Sallallahu just like as we should be as Muslims anyone who exemplifies and represents what we stand for, we respect that with the utmost respect, regardless of what their religion is. I don't care what their religion is. They represent and exemplify the same exact thing, exude the same exact behaviors that we are commanded to exude in our religion. We respect that. So the Prophet ﷺ said to her, Ya Hanata, Lo anna abaki mata musliman la tarahamna alayhi. He said, oh lady, he said, if your father had died as a Muslim, we would have had so much mercy on him. We would have had mercy on him. Tarahamna alayhi. We would have made dua for him and we would have asked Allah to have mercy upon him. We would have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make his grave spacious and to give him a good life in the hereafter. But all of that, you know, was, you know, rendered null and void. The fact that he died as a mushrik. He died on shirk, he died on polytheism. So there's nothing that we can really do, but I respect your father. I'm sorry I can't do more for him at this point. However, I have a great deal of respect for your father. If he had died as a Muslim, we would have had so much mercy on him. ثم أكرمها وأعادها صنية محتسمة then the Prophet ﷺ was generous to her and he returned her home safely to her family. فَلَقِيَتْ أَخَاهَا عَدِي فَقَالَتْ يَا قَطَّعْ أَوْ يَا قُطُوعْ يَا عُقُوقْ تَرَقْتَنِي فِي الْبَيْتِ جِدْتُ مِنْ عِنْدِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم حَقَّا so on her return home, she met her brother, Adi ibn Hatim. And she said, Ya Qudu' Ya Uquq Oh you severer of ties. Basically calling him a coward. 
You left me in the house and you fled to Damascus and left me there by myself and I was captured. She said, I just came from being with the messenger of Allah, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She said, and he is the most righteous of people. The one who connects family ties and the most merciful of people. You see what his representation of Islam did to her? How the Prophet ﷺ treated her? How that impacted her? The greatest form of da'wah is in your akhlaq, in your adab, in your mannerisms, in the way that you treat people. That is the greatest form of da'wah. Da'li bima yaqul. Leave me in what comes out of your mouth. Person doesn't care what comes out of your mouth. If what comes out of your behavior is not consistent or congruent with what comes out of your mouth, it means absolutely nothing. You can say, I'm Muslim, I'm Salafi, I'm this, I'm that all day long. If your behavior is not congruent, is not consistent what comes out of, with what comes out of your mouth, it means nothing. Haba'in mentura. It's like floating dust particles. It has absolutely no weight. It has no weight. Make sure what comes out of your mouth is consistent with your behavior. فَتَهَيَّأَ عَدِي وَلَبِسَ لِبَاسَهُ وَرَكَّبَ الصَّلِيبَ النَّصْرَانِيَّ عَلَى صَدْرِهِ وَأَتَى إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ So Adi, feeling like, alright, this guy has now impacted my sister. I need to go talk to him. My sister... The thoughts of my sister becoming a Muslim and abandoning, you know, Christianity or abandoning our religion is something that I can't have. You know, the thing is, is that Christians are, are very diligent when it comes to, you know, imposing or superimposing Jesus on everybody else. But the moment someone else decides, someone from their faith decides that I still love Jesus, but I need more. Than just Jesus. I need more than Jesus. Because when I converted to Islam, I didn't abandon Jesus. I accepted Jesus. I, I love Jesus even more because Islam taught me the correct way to view Jesus. So it's like, you know, you're getting Jesus and more and some. You're getting Jesus and some. It's like you need Jesus. I got Jesus. <laughs> I got Jesus. <laughs> Don't worry about that. I got Jesus. But I have Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam too. The same prophet that he prophesied in your book that there was going to come another there was going to come another messenger. And you can speculate about who you believe it was. There is no doubt that this man Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There is no doubt. That this man was by far one of the most influential men that has ever stepped foot on this earth. The greatest humanitarian that has ever walked the walk of a humanitarian. As a matter of fact, he pioneered humanitarianism. He pioneered that. Anyway, so Adi ibn Hatim, he wore his clothes, the dress of his Christian faith. He put the cross around his neck. And he headed towards Medina to go sit with this man, Muhammad. Because he ran from him the first time. And then he captured his sister and now he had an impact on his sister. So now I got to go confront him myself. So Adi got dressed, put on his cross, you know, because that's... Validation for many Christians. Put your cross around your neck. That's validation. As a, as a person of faith, there's nothing tangible or materialistic that you need in this world to validate your faith. Your faith in God does not need to be validated by an image or picture or a statue or a cross or something materialistic to validate your faith. You've materialized God in the form of Jesus simply because you had to have something tangible to see. Tangible. You had to manifest God in the form of Jesus simply because you could not just believe in Jesus. You could not just believe in God. 
without an image. You had to have an image. Faith does not require that. As a person who believes in God, I don't require an image. I don't require some type of cross or some type of object or emblem to validate my faith. As I said yesterday, even with the thaw for a Muslim, it does not validate me. It doesn't validate my faith in God. But we live in a time where faith has to be validated by materialism. And it happens on so many levels. Faith has to be manifest. Faith has to be validated by materialism. Tangible things that you can see, touch, feel, can't just believe in God. Well, Allah, I've always been terrified as a kid walking into a church and seeing these statues and these images and this picture of so-called Jesus with his hands, you know, stapled to, you know, the cross. And I mean, like, what, what type of message are we sending children? I was, I was just at a Catholic church, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And I walk in through the church to get to the, the, the little recreational area that they had to give a lecture. And I'm just looking at the statues, man, of Mary and uh, what they, uh, you know, they believe is Mary. And I'm, I'm just, I'm terrified of these images, these statues. That is modern day idolatry. It's idolatry. Statues and images. Of God and the mother of God. I mean like subhanallah lazim man. If you just stop for a moment and step outside of yourself. You just celebrated the day that God was born. The day that Jesus was born on Christmas. And we've turned into this commercialized celebration. Of buying toys and Santa Claus. And what have you done to your religion man? What have you done to your faith? That has absolutely nothing to do with the belief in Jesus Christ. Nothing to do with worship of God. Nothing. But we've, we've, we've taken it all in. Everything. So he puts on his cross and he heads to Medina. رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وأجلسه في بيته وقدم وقدم له مخدة ليجلس عليه فأبى وجلس على التراب فقال له النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أشهد أنك من الذين لا يريدون علوا في الأرض ولا فسادة. So when the Sahaba saw Adi ibn Hatim al-Ta'i Approaching Medina, they went and they told the Prophet Wasallam. The people began to scramble, you know, trying to prepare for his arrival. And when he finally reached Medina, he came to the house of the Prophet Wasallam. The Prophet invited them into his home. Listen to the conversation between these two men. The Prophet Wasallam invited Adi ibn Hatim into his house, into his home. Nothing wrong with inviting a Christian into your home. And he came in, and the Prophet Sallallahu offered him a pillow to sit on. And Adi refused the pillow and decided, I'm going to sit on the floor. I don't need your pillow. You know, I'm uncomfortable just being here. But I have to confront you. The Prophet Sallallahu you know, just trying to honor his guests, offered him a pillow to sit on. And he decided, no, I don't need your pillow. I'm going to sit on the floor. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began and he said, Adi, I bear witness that you are from amongst those who do not want superiority in the earth, nor do they wish to cause corruption. Acknowledging the fact that it took a lot for Adi to humble himself and come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet is acknowledging that. That I know that, you know, you. this is an ayah from the Qur'an. تِلْكَ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَ نَجْعَلُهَا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُرِيدُونَ عُلُوًّا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فَسَادَةً That this is the home of the hereafter that we have promised 
to those of you who do not wish or seek superiority in the earth, nor to cause corruption. This is a verse from the Quran. So when Adi sat with the Prophet Wasallam, the Prophet said to him, I bear witness, Adi, that you are from amongst those who do not wish superiority, do not seek superiority in the earth, nor corruption. وَبَيْنَمَا هُوَ جَالِسٌ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ يَعْنِي جِبْرِيلْ يَنْزِلُ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ الْبَيِّنَاتِ فَتَلَهَا النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِمُنَاسَبَةِ بِمُنَاسَبَةِ مَقْدَمْ عَدِي بْنِ هَاتِمْ وَهِيَ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ عُزَيْنُ بْنُ اللَّهِ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَى مَسِيحُ بْنُ اللَّهِ ذلك قول بأقولهم بأفواههم يضاهئون قول الذين كفروا من قبل من قبل قاتلهم الله أن يؤفكون اتخذوا أحبارهم ورهبانهم أربابا من دون الله والمسيح ابن مريم وما أمروا إلا ليعبدوا إلها واحدا لا إله إلا هو سبحانه عما يشركون so as they are sitting there talking Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ. Angel Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ while he's sitting there talking to Adi. And he brought some ayats from the Qur'an to the Prophet ﷺ that was appropriate for the sitting that the Prophet ﷺ was having. Two ayats that Angel Jibreel brought the Prophet ﷺ during this time. The first ayah was an ayah in Surah At-Tawbah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, excuse me, uh, another, uh, for, the first ayah was the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ عُزَيْنُ بْنُ اللَّهِ And the Jews say that Ezra is the son of God. Ezra was like the Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab of Judaism. He came and he reformed and, you know, reformed Judaism, a more orthodox approach to Judaism, just using the Torah, the traditions of Musa. And they extolled him to such a degree that they called him the son of God. So the Jews, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ Uzair ibn Allah, And the Jews say that Uzair or Ezra is the son of God. وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَسِيحِ بْنُ عِيسَى بْنُ اللَّهِ And the Christians say that Jesus is the Son of God. All of these different religious groups attributing children, attributing mothers to God. Muslims, we play the middle and we don't associate any partners, any sons, any daughters, any mothers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ That he was not beget nor was he begotten. He does not beget, nor was he begotten, nor is there anything comparable to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has no children, nor was he given birth to, he has no mother, no children, and there is nothing comparable to him. That one ayat, and sort of to ikhlas, that we recite just about every day, one of the shortest surahs in the Qur'an, that one ayat, refutes all of the claims that all of these different traditions have about God. Mary is the mother of God, Jesus is the son of God, Usair or Ezra is the son of God, we are the children of God. One ayat, one verse in the Quran refutes all of that. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He was not beget nor was he begotten. He does not beget, nor was he begotten. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ And there is nothing comparable to him. Nothing comparable to him. So the ayat continues that the Jews, they say, Uzair is the son of Allah, son of God. وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ مَسِيحِ بْنُ اللَّهِ And the Christians say that the Messiah, Jesus, is the son of God. ذَارِكَ قَوْلُهُمْ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ that is their statement with their own mouths. God did not give you any authority to say such. Yes, in the Bible it says that, you know, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. 
But it also says that about Prophet David as well. That his David is his only begotten son. And I mean, there's a whole argument of whether or not that is even the words of God to, to begin with. That's number one. And number two, even if we said that was the words of God, is that to be taken literally? Jesus, in another verse in the Bible, says he is the son of man, not the son of God. He is the son of man. From his own mouth, Jesus, in his own words, he is the son of man. God has no sons, has no daughters, has no mother. God is God, the creator, the provider, cherisher, sustainer, maintainer of all that exists. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ذَلِكَ قَوْلُهُمْ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ That is their statement with their own mouths. يُضَاهِئُونَ قَوْلَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ قَبْلِ They are only regurgitating, reiterating the statements and the claims of people that came before them. No intellect involved, just blind following. That's what I was taught. I was raised in the church. That's the way my mama raised me. That's the way my daddy raised me. We church going people, nobody stops to use their intellect to question their faith. To question why is it that we believe in this? Where did this belief come from? No one stops to question. Blind following, blind faith, and in Islam there is no blind faith. And that's one of the things that I've always respected about Islam. That there is no blind faith. Even in our aqidah, even in our belief system, there's proofs and evidences for why we believe in the things that we believe in. There's no blind faith. There's some things that require just pure faith. But for the vast majority of the things that we believe in, we have proof and evidences for the things that we believe in. Without a doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God does not want to lead his servants to be blind followers. God wants to empower us. How are you going to influence someone else if you yourself are not empowered with the beliefs that you claim you have? We have to be empowered with those things in order for us to influence other people. If you you running on a blind faith, you can't convince nobody of blind faith, man. You can't convince nobody. You're not going to convince me if it's blind faith. And I ask you, well, why do we believe in that? Where did that come from? Oh, you know, that's just part of the tradition. Just have faith, brother. No, I'm not just having faith. No, you have to explain to me why I should believe in that. Because you're asking me essentially to make this a part of the fabric of my being without any evidence, without any proof. I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'm sorry. Even the stories and the narrations that we have about the Prophet Wasallam, we have a chain of narration. We have documentation of everything, a chain of narration, chain of people who heard from this one, who heard from that one, who heard from that one, all the way back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the people involved in the immediate incident. Nothing is blind faith, man. Everything we have, we have a chain of narrations. A chain of narrators whose scholars have come along and have questioned their character, scrutinized their character. This one, Sayyid al Hifth or Su al Hifth, this one has a bad memory. This one, Taghayyira fi Akhira, he began to change in the later part of his years in terms of his memory. So we accept his narrations at the beginning part of his life, but we are skeptical about his narrations towards the ending of his life. Daqiq Jiddin, so precise. Wallah al in Islam, I mean, you can just relax because everything is explained in detail. Everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that we sit down this book to clarify everything. As a clarification for everything. No blind following here, man. No blind following here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the next ayah. وَرُهْبَانَهُمْ أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَمَا أُمِنُوا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَالْمَسِيحِ بْنُ مَرْيَمِ وَمَا أُمِنُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا إِلَهًا وَاحِدًا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ 
Subhanahu amma yushrikun. Very powerful verse. Angel Jibreel brought to the Prophet ﷺ while he was sitting there with Adi ibn Hatim. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the Christians, they took their monks and their high priests as gods besides Allah. And the Messiah, the son of Maryam. And every verse in the Quran, anytime Jesus' name is mentioned, he's always mentioned Jesus, the son of Mary. To emphasize that he is not the son of God, he is the son of Mary. He is not the son of God, he is the son of Mary. Isa ibn Maryam. Every time, just about every time in the Quran, Jesus' name is mentioned, he is mentioned as Jesus, the son of Mary. Because he was not the son of God. He said, and the Jew and the Christians, they took their monks and their high priests, their people, their scholars, as gods besides Allah. And Masih ibn Maryam and Jesus, the son of Mary, took him as a god besides Allah. And they had only been commanded to worship one God. And they had only been commanded to worship one God, that's it. La ilaha illahu. There's nothing worthy of worship, no deity worthy of worship except God. Subhanahu. Amma yushrikun. Glory be to him, and high is he above with the associate with him. فَقَالَ عَدِي وَعَرَفَ أَنَّ الْخِطَابَ لَهُ وَأَنَّهُ الْمَقْصَدْ قَالَ بِاللَّفْظِ الْفَحْوِي إِيَّاكَ أَعْنِي وَاسْمَعِي يَجَارَ مَا عَبَدْنَاهُمْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So Adi, when he heard the Prophet ﷺ recite these two verses, he knew that the verses was about him. He knew that this verse was referring to him. So he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a very, you know, snappy way, he said, uh, we didn't used to worship them. What are you talking about? We never, we never took our, basically saying that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't know what he's talking about, right? As some Christians, when they talk to you, they don't realize that you used to be Christian too, right? You used to be heavy into the church. I went to Sunday school. I was baptized. So when they talk to you, they talk to you from a place where it's like, you don't know my religion. You don't know what you're talking about. It's like, do please. I know the Bible better than you. <laughs> do please. I've been, you know what I'm saying? Like, do please. I was raised in the church. Are you kidding me? I was raised in the church. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not just talking to you from a place of uh, what I don't know what I'm talking about. I was raised in the church. And there was nothing wrong with the teachings of the church. Those people say, well, you probably wasn't a real Christian Christian anyway. Because no real Christian would do this or do that. Or no Christian would turn away from their faith. It had nothing to do with the teachings of the church. It had everything to do with the fact that my heart would not accept what is natural, except what is natural. My heart would not accept a foreign belief. My heart would not accept a foreign belief that you force into your heart. It just wouldn't accept it. My heart just remained pure. For whatever reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected my heart from embracing and accepting a foreign. It's just like the body and the spirit works the same way. If you have an organ in your body that needs to be replaced, right? A lung or kidney or heart, you have an organ in your body that has to be replaced. All right? Listen to this. If you have to replace that organ, a lung or a kidney or heart or something like this, the body does not accept an organ that is not originally a part of it. So if you are going to put a foreign organ in your body, you have to take medication that tricks your body into believing that that organ is actually yours. Because the moment your body realizes or recognizes that this heart 
or this kidney or this lung is not actually a part of it. It is a foreign organ that was put into it. The moment your body realizes that, you start to have failure, kidney failure, heart failure. You start to have failure with those organs because the body does not accept something that is foreign to it that was not originally a part of it. Your faith, your spirit, your soul functions the same way. If you try to force feed yourself a belief that God did not naturally create you with, your heart is going to reject it. Your soul will reject it. Your spirit will reject it. And that's exactly what happened. So it's no fault on the church that I'm not a Christian today. No fault on the church. No fault on the preaching and the teaching of the pastor or the minister or the priest. It's no fault on them. It has everything to do with the natural process that God created the human being, the natural order that God created the human being to follow. And you can fool yourself all day long because when we get in the jam, we run straight to the church and oh Jesus, and you forcing yourself because you don't really believe in that. You don't really believe in that. You know and I know. You don't really believe in that. You force yourself to believe that. The mind will believe whatever you tell it. The mind will believe whatever you tell it. You force yourself to believe that. Anyway, and I know that people can argue with me. I'm, I'm just saying that from all of the Christians that I know that are Muslim now. <laughs> I mean, you go to African American communities. I would say 90% of those that are in that community are converts to Islam that were once Christian. <laughs> you have a whole congregation, five, six, seven hundred people. 90% of them used to be Christian. So all of them are wrong. All, I mean, all of them, they went to bad churches and they received bad preaching and teaching about Christianity. I mean, that, that has to speak volumes on some level. If you just have an honest conversation with yourself. But I'm not here to debate whether or not you believe in this or you believe in that. You're totally, you know, at liberty to believe in whatever you want to believe in. But you will be accountable on the day of judgment, Allah gave you your soul. God gave you your soul. He gave you your heart. And you will be responsible for what you do with it. So God gave you 80 years to live on earth. And you took those 80 years and you worshiped Jesus instead of God, the one who gave you the life, who gave Jesus life. And you choose to worship God. And you choose to worship Jesus instead of God. You reap what you sow. As one of the scholars, he said, La tal'ab bi'ayam harthik. Do not play with the time when you should be sowing your crops. He said, Man dhiyya ayam harthihi nadima yawma hasadi. That if you play with the time that you should be sowing your crops, you're going to be a sorry soul on the day that you come to collect your harvest. You're going to be a sorry soul. Don't play around, man. So Adi, he said to the Prophet Sallallahu We didn't used to worship these priests and these, uh, you know, these these uh, monks and high priests. We didn't worship them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had to correct him. He said, "Bel The Prophet Sallallahu said, "No, you didn't used to worship them. You did worship them. You worship your monks and your high priests." He said, "Ama ahalu lakum al haram." He said, didn't your monks and your high priests make permissible what God made impermissible? How many Christians eat pork? Are you supposed to eat pork? Is not pork impermissible in your book? How many Christians drink? Woke up this morning, you know, you know, with the after effect from last night. How many are going to get off work today and drink? In the name of Jesus, can you turn up a bottle of alcohol and say, in the name of Jesus Christ? If you can do that, then drinking is permissible. If you take a bottle of alcohol, liquor, and you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you turn it up to your mouth, 
If you feel comfortable doing that, then you are, <laughs> you might be unsalvageable. <laughs> you may be irreparable. I don't think any Christian in their right mind could turn up a bottle of alcohol, a beer container, to their mouth and say, in the name of Jesus Christ. And the same thing applies for us as Muslims. If you can't say Bismillah over it before you do it, then that should be an indication that it's not permissible, man. You don't need to ask no scholar, no sheikh. Use your morality, man. If you can't say Bismillah over it, if you can't say in the name of God over it before you do it, then it's not permissible. It's not permissible. I don't care how many scholars tell you it's okay. If it's not something that you can say bismillah over, it's not permissible. If a Christian cannot say in the name of Jesus Christ before you do an act, then that should be an indication that it's not, it's not permissible. So the Prophet said, didn't your monks and your high priests make permissible what God made impermissible? Usury? Interest? Is not interest wrong in Christianity? <laughs> but you still do it. You live in your big homes and sometimes it's the preacher, the pastor, <laughs> the leader of the community, knee deep in sin, on the pulpit every Sunday, knee deep in sin. Isn't fornication and adultery wrong in Christianity? But we cultivate in this boyfriend-girlfriend dynamic even in the church. Even in the church. You got the preacher who the pastor, the leader of the community, knee deep in sin. He lives in a big home that is bought on interest. And interest is wrong in Christianity, just as it's wrong in Islam. You eat pork. Pork is haram in Islam, and just as it's impermissible in Christianity. You drink, which is wrong in Islam and wrong in Christianity. Your women don't cover their hair. My grandmother never went to church with her hair uncovered, ever. Never went to church without a hat or something covering her hair. Look at the way women go to church today. And you have the audacity to tell me, do I have Jesus? You don't even have Jesus. You got to be kidding me, man. You're walking around throwing Jesus around like he's some type of sword, some type of armor to protect you from God. Throwing him around like he's some type of weapon to beat everybody else up over the head. You ain't got Jesus. You need to love Jesus. You don't even have Jesus. How dare you? How dare you have the audacity to tell somebody they need to find Jesus? You need to find Jesus. You live, you live a life of sin and have the audacity to talk about somebody not having Jesus. Your whole life is saturated with sin. And you have the audacity to tell somebody to go find Jesus. You have got to be kidding me, man. Could Jesus take you by the hand and walk with you every day through your life? The amount of sin that we are involved in on a daily basis. And you have the audacity to tell somebody Jesus loves you. I know Jesus loves you. Uh, loves me. You need to find Jesus. <laughs> I, I never lost him. I just transitioned from Christianity to Islam. I never lost Jesus in the process. I never lost Jesus in the process. I just turned from worshiping him to seeing him for who he is. And as a prophet, a righteous man, a humanitarian. One of the greatest men, one of the greatest prophets of God. But I don't worship him. That's it. That's the only thing that I did. I never lost Jesus. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَحَرَّمُوا عَلَيْكُمُ الْحَلَالِ فَحَرَمْتُمُوهُ And they made haram what God made permissible. They made haram. They made impermissible what God made permissible. Right? And you follow them in this. And Adi said, yes. The Prophet said, So then that was your worship of them. It's called shirk al ta'a. Shirk al ta'a. The polytheism in your obedience. The polytheism that is in subtle polytheism that is in your obedience. There is no obedience to the creation and disobedience to the creator. 
ثم تنمر له النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وقرب منه وقرب وقرب منه واخذ بتلالي بتلابيب ثيابه وقال يعدي التفر التفر ان يقال الله اكبر في الارض so the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he came closer to adi sat closer to him and he tapped him and he said adi he said are you running away from saying that god is the greatest on earth god is the greatest are you, is that what you're running away from atfirra an yuqal allahu akbar fil ard are you running away from saying that god is the greatest on earth are you running away from that he said hal ta'lam akbar min allah he said adi do you know anyone greater than god do you know anyone greater than god not jesus not moses not muhammad do you know anyone greater than god what are you running away from all i'm saying is allahu akbar god is the greatest la ilaha illallah there's no god worthy of worship except god that's all i'm saying that's all the religion of islam is he said are you too arrogant to say allahu akbar god is the greatest on earth why can't you say that he said ata'lam akbar min allah do you know anyone greater than god He said, Ya Adi, atufirra an yuqal la ilaha illallah fil ard? He said, Adi, are you running away from saying there's nothing, no deity, no God worthy of worship except God? In the earth, are you running, is this what you're running away from? Remind you, mind you, when Khalid and Walid came to the mountain to go give them da'wah, they ran. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asking them, what are you running from? <laughs> What are you running from? Are you running from saying Allahu Akbar? God is the greatest? That's what you running from? Hal ta'lam akbar min Allah? Do you know anyone greater than God? Do you know anyone greater than Allah? What did you run for? Why did you flee the mountain and run to Syria? Why did you run to Sham? Why did you run to Damascus? That's what you running from? Is that what you're running from? He said, "Atufirra and you call la ilaha illallah." You running from saying that there's no god worthy of worship except God? Is that what you're running from? Is that what Islamophobia is all about? Is that what you are in fear of, you Islamophobes? You're in fear of someone who says they only worship God alone. That's what you're in fear of. But you condemn me if I'm homophobic, if I'm scared of a man who has the audacity to go into the anal of another man. Hell yeah, I'm scared of him. Hell yeah. Islamophobe all day long. Absolutely. Terrified. I don't want my children around you. I don't want my family around you. I don't even want to be around you. Absolutely. I'm an Islamophobe. You're not going to play reverse psychology with me. Oh, you're an Islamophobe. Absolutely, I'm an Islamophobe. I have absolutely no problem saying that. I am scared of any man who has the gall and the audacity to go and penetrate the anal of another man. Absolutely. Because that individual has brought on himself the wrath of God that he can't even imagine. any nation look at the great nation of rome and persia and all of these great empires that we extol to such a degree every single one of those nations was brought to their ruin when homosexuality became prevalent amongst them absolutely absolutely if you're a muslim and you're not a islamophobe i i don't i don't even know what to say to you But we get up into these universities and these colleges and these higher educational levels and we placate in the feelings of this one and that one. No, I'm not an Islamophobe. You know, you know, you know, homophobe, you know, homosexuals are our brothers in faith and our brothers. Nah, man, miss me with all of that. Miss me with all of that. Nah, I'm in fear of you. I'm scared to death 
of you. Because I don't ever know when the wrath of Allah is going to come down on you and I don't want to be next to you when that happens. Look at the amount of homosexuals that commit suicide. The amount of homosexuals that end up with AIDS or some type of communicable disease. The psychological trauma that they go through when coming out of the closet. If it was a normal process, you wouldn't have to come out of the closet. If you were born this way, as you say, you were born this way, right? Then you wouldn't have to come out of the closet. Coming out of the closet is an indication that it is a foreign behavior, right? A foreign behavior. So, yes, I'm homophobic. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm terrified of a man that would have the gall and the audacity to penetrate the anal of another man. In the Bible, they are referred to as sodomites. Sodomites. From the town of Sodom and Gomorrah. Engaging in the act of sodomy. The thing is, is that when college students haze one another and shove things up the anal of other college students in, you know, in this ritual to get accepted into a fraternity, they go to jail for it. <laughs> but we marry people in this society who do the same thing. I guess it's an issue of consensual, right? Being consensual. Anyway. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, Adi, are you running? From saying that there is no God worthy of worship except God in the earth. So Adi had no other option to realize but to realize that what am I running from? Am I running from saying that God is the greatest? When Muslims say, Allahu Akbar, it sounds passionate, right? And it, it kind of, you know, people get a little upset, you know, a little afraid when you hear a Muslim yell, Allahu Akbar, right? But all he's saying is God is the greatest. That's it. Does that startle you? Maybe his enthusiasm, you know, sometimes we can get a little, you know, overzealous and overenthusiastic sometimes. When we yell Allahu Akbar. But it only means God is the greatest. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, A ta'alam akbar min Allah. Adi, do you know anyone greater than God? <laughs> do you know? I'm asking you as a Christian. Do you know anyone greater than God? Not Jesus. Do you know anyone greater than God? This is an honest conversation to have with yourself. Don't worry about, oh, your family was raised, you were raised Christian and your family going to look at you different if you change your faith. Alright, this is not about how your family is going to view you. This is about you accepting what is right, what is natural. What is natural. So that when you stand before God, you can know that I made the right choice. Are you running away from saying, La ilaha illallah, there's no God, no deity worthy of worship except God? Is anything wrong with that? Is anything wrong with that? As a Muslim, someone who believes that there's only one God worthy of worship. That's what I believe. Am I wrong for that? <laughs> Am I wrong for believing in one God and worshiping that one God almighty? Am I wrong for that? It's, a, it's an honest conversation you have to have with yourself. هذا وصل الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا حديب بن حاتم he embraced Islam right then and there in the house of the Prophet Sallallahu He said, I bear witness that there's no God worthy of worship except God. And I bear witness that you, Muhammad, are his messenger. And he walked away while he was uttering La ilaha illallah with his tongue. His heart had already accepted it. His heart had already accepted it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kithira wa akhiru da'wana ala alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.